the power grip. This is what you call it when you make a fist with your hand cocked in a slightly extended position. The hand is frequently required for motions such as grasping that require large, powerful muscles. At other times, however, the hand is a precision tool that generates intricate motions and a collection of bulking muscles within the hand would impede these precision motions. To maximize both power and precision, the powerful digital movers have been moved out of the hand into the forearm and are connected to the digits through long, thinned digital tendons. In the next lecture sessions, we'll introduce the intricate hand muscles, which are less bulky and designed to assist with the precision movements of the hand. Today, however, our focus is on the power grip muscles of the antebrachium. Welcome back. In our first session today, we looked at the bones and joints of the forearm. We now look at the muscles that provide most of the mass of the forearm. For the sake of organization, remember that we can broadly divide these muscles into those of the anterior compartment involved in flexion and pronation and the posterior compartment involved in extension and supination. This session will focus on the origin, insertions, and actions of each of these muscles, as well as to look at some soft tissue injuries seen in this region. We'll start with the anterior compartment. These muscles have a common origin point off the medial epicondyle of the humerus, as well as from various points along the anterior surfaces of the radius, ulna, and interosseous membrane. The majority of these muscles cross anterior to the wrist joint. As such, these muscles are involved in flexion of the wrist and digits and pronation of the forearm. As there is a large collection of muscles in the anterior compartment, it helps to subdivide these muscles into superficial, intermediate, and deep layers. We start with the superficial muscle group. These muscles originate primarily from the common flexor tendon of the medial epicondyle of the humerus. Tendinitis of the common flexor tendon can occur with repetitive flexion activities and is commonly referred to as golfer's elbow. The most medial of the group is the flexor carpi ulnaris muscle. In addition to its origin off the common flexor tendon, a portion of the muscle wraps posterior around the ulna to originate off the olecranon process and shaft. The flexor carpi ulnaris is thus a bicipital muscle, made up of the humeral and ulnar heads. Note that the ulnar nerve enters the anterior compartment by diving through the bifurcation created between these two segments. Distally, the flexor carpi ulnaris has a broad insertion on the pisiform, hook of the hamate bone, and proximal portion of the fifth metacarpal bone. Because of its line of pull, it tends to produce both flexion and ulnar deviation of the wrist, depending on the synergistic muscles it's combined with. The flexor carpi ulnaris is distinct in that it is the only muscle of the forearm to receive no innervation from the median nerve, but instead receive the entirety of its innervation from the ulnar nerve. Pretty easy to remember as they both have ulna in their names. Adjacent to the flexor carpi ulnaris muscle coming off the common flexor tendon is the palmaris longus muscle. This is considered a vestigial muscle, meaning that it is frequently absent in a large portion of the population. It has a unique insertion in that the tendon blends into the palmar fascia deep to the skin of the hand in an arrangement similar to what we saw with the bicipital aponeurosis. We therefore identify no bony insertion for this muscle. The muscle has a rudimentary function in tensing the palmar fascia, which probably assists in the primate activity of hanging from tree branches. Lateral to the palmaris longus off the common flexor tendon is the flexor carpi radialis muscle. Again, we see the muscle coming off the common flexor tendon. The muscle projects deep within the connective tissue in the palmar surface of the hand to the base of the second metacarpal bone. Flexor carpi radialis produces the combined effects of wrist flexion and radial deviation. The final muscle in the superficial group is the pronator teres muscle. In addition to its origin off the common flexor tendon, pronator teres is another bicipital muscle, having a small ulnar head, shown here in beige, originating from the anterior surface of the coronary process. This bicipital division is significant in that the median nerve courses between the two heads to enter the anterior compartment. The two heads converge to insert on the lateral surface of the mid-shaft of the radius, 
As previously discussed, the muscles contract to produce pronation of the forearm. Next, we discuss the intermediate group. Only a single muscle to consider here, the flexor digitorum superficialis muscle. It has an extensive origin and, once again, a bicipital division. The humeral ulnar head originates off the common flexor tendon and coronoid process deep to the pronator teres, while the radial head originates off the proximal portion of the radial shaft. The muscle then splits to produce four tendons that run distally towards the wrist. The tendons pass through the wrist in a characteristic two-by-two two stacked formation. Medially, the tendon of the ring finger lies superior to the tendon of the pinky finger, while laterally, the tendon of the middle finger lies superior to the tendon of the index finger. Once past the wrist, the tendons diverge to insert on the middle phalanx in digits 2 through 5. As they approach this insertion, they split, allowing the tendons from a deeper muscle to project past them. As these muscles don't actually insert on the distal phalanges, they serve to contract the wrist, metacarpal phalangeal, and proximal interphalangeal joints, but not the distal interphalangeal joints. This takes us into a deeper muscle layer. These muscles originate off the anterior surface of the radia, ulna, and interosseous membrane. First is the complementary muscle to flexor digitorum superficialis, the flexor digitorum profundus. Note that the terms superficialis and profundus mean superficial and deep, respectively, which reflects the positioning of these two respective muscles. Profundus has a broad origin off the anterior surface of the ulna and medial half of the interosseous ligament. As with the flexor digitorum superficialis, the muscle splits into four separate tendons as it approaches the wrist. Unlike the superficialis muscle, which bunches up to squeeze through the narrow superficial portion of the carpal tunnel, the profundus tendons are able to run side by side in the deeper, wider portion of the tunnel. Again, as we saw with the superficialis muscle, the four tendons diverge and each runs inferior to its superficial counterpart to project towards digits two through five. These then are the tendons that we observe projecting to the distal phalanges from under the flexor digitorum superficialis tendon following their split. As these tendons insert on the distal phalanges, contraction of flexor digitorum profundus contributes to flexion of the wrist, metacarpophalangeal, and proximal and distal interphalangeal joints. Lateral to the flexor digitorum profundus is the flexor pollicis longus muscle. Pollicis is the anatomical term for thumb, and so this represents one of two flexors we have that are specific to the thumb. Flexor digitorum profundus has a broad origin off the anterior surface of the radius and lateral half of the interosseous ligament. Its tendon runs through the ipsilateral portion of the carpal tunnel to insert on the distal phalanx of the first digit. As a result, the muscle produces flexion of the first metacarpophalangeal joint and interphalangeal joint. We'll discuss its counterpart, the flexor pollicis brevis muscle, in our next lesson on the intrinsic muscles of the hand. The final muscle to consider is the pronator quadratus muscle, which is named to reflect its geometric distinction from the rounded pronator teres muscle. It attaches to the anterior surfaces of both the distal radius and ulna. Of the two pronators of the wrist, pronator quadratus is considered to be the most powerful. Having completed our discussion of the anterior compartment of the forearm, we now turn our attention to the posterior compartment. Collectively, these muscles originate from the lateral epicondyle of the humerus and the posterior surface of the radius, ulna, and interosseous membrane. Most cross posterior to the wrist and are consequently involved in wrist and digit extension. The tendons that do pass into the carpus run inferior to an extensor retinaculum, which divides the tendon into sips separate compartments and holds them fast to the carpus. All are innervated by the deep branch of the radial nerve. As with the anterior compartment, we can divide the posterior compartment up, this time into superficial and deep muscles. We'll start with the brachioradialis muscle. This is actually a bit of an anomaly for the posterior compartment. Although it originates close to the other posterior compartment muscles, in this case off the supracondylar ridge, and receives its innervation from the radial nerve, it actually passes anterior to the elbow joint to insert on the shaft of the radius. Consequently, it serves as an additional flexor of the elbow and doesn't act upon the wrist at all.
The second muscle in our list also originates off the supracondylar ridge. It has an exceptionally long name, but nicely highlights the process of systematic naming of muscles. The majority of antebrachial muscles are first named according to their function. We see examples of flexors, pronators, and we'll soon discuss supinators. In this case, we have an extensor. Second, the muscle is typically named according to the distal joint it acts upon. Since this muscle inserts just distal to the wrist, we use the anatomical term for wrist, carpus, or carpi. Third, in instances where there are more than one muscle producing the same motion at the same joint, we need to distinguish between them. In this instance, we have an extensor on both the radial and ulnar side of the wrists, so this is identified by radialis. Note that we typically use medialis and lateralis in this situation, but the confusion of what is medial and lateral in pronation and supination makes naming them according to the bone they insert closer to to make more sense. Finally, in this particular situation, we actually have two carpal extensors that both insert on the radial side. Son of a bee. Okay, well, in this situation, one is distinctly longer than the other, so as a result, we have extensor carpi radialis longus. Like I said, it's a mouthful, but systematically, it makes sense. The extensor carpi radialis longus runs along the posterior aspect of the radius under a series of tendons that we'll discuss shortly. It then passes under the extensor retinaculum to insert on the base of the second metacarpal bone. As the name implies, it contracts to extend the wrist, but will also work with the flexor carpi radialis to generate radial deviation. Adjacent to the extensor carpi radialis longus muscle is another extensor of the wrist. You probably already guessed it. This is the extensor carpi radialis brevis muscle. This marks an important anatomical rule. These names always occur in groups. If there's a longus, then somewhere there has to be a commonly named brevis muscle. This is the first of a series of muscles to originate as part of the common extensor tendon off the lateral epicondyle. The extensor carpi radialis brevis takes a very similar course to the longus muscle, inserting on the base of the third metacarpal. It also shares a common set of actions, wrist extension and radial deviation. Also originating off the common extensor tendon is extensor digitorum. Note the brevity in the name. Thinking back for a moment to the flexor digitorum superficialis and flexor digitorum profundus muscles in the anterior compartment, the distinction was necessary due to the fact that there were two muscles sharing a common function, flexion of the digits. With extension, we have only a single muscle performing the duty, so there's no need to add anything beyond what's already there. Okay, so that being said, some anatomists still like to complicate things, so the term communis is occasionally thrown in, but is completely optional and a little pretentious sounding, truth be told. Similar to the flexor digitorum muscles, extensor digitorum splits into four separate tendons that project through the dorsum of the hand. Once in the digits, they expand out into the complex tendinous structures known as the extensor hoods, which will be discussed in greater detail in the lecture on the hand. The extensor digitorum muscle acts to generate extension of the wrist and digits two through five, clear through the distal phalange. In addition to the four tendons of the extensor digitorum, an accessory extensor can be seen running to the fifth digit. This arises from a small fusiform extensor digiti minimi muscle, which blends into the extensor digitorum muscle, but passes under the extensor retinaculum in a separate compartment. This small muscle contributes to extension of the fifth digit exclusively. The final part of the superficial group is the extensor carpi ulnaris muscle. Note the absence of the longus brevis distinction, meaning that there is only a single wrist extensor on the ulnar side. Extensor carpi ulnaris originates off both the lateral epicondyle and the posterior shaft of the ulna and projects into the carpus, passing just lateral to the ulnar head to insert on the base of the fifth metacarpal. It contracts to generate wrist extension and works synergistically with flexor carpi ulnaris to generate ulnar deviation. This brings us to the deep posterior compartment of the antebrachium. Collectively, these muscles originate off the posterior surface of the radius, ulna, and interosseous membrane. Several project laterally from under the superficial group, primarily inserting on the thumb, and are thus called the outcropping muscles, 
Note that, as we described earlier, the tendons for many of these muscles project over the extensor carpi muscle tendons as they cross one another. First of this group is the abductor pollicis longus muscle. It has a broad origin off the posterior aspect of the radius, ulna, and interosseous membrane. The tendon projects laterally to insert on the base of the first metacarpal bone. Because of its line of pull, the muscle works to abduct the thumb away from the midline, just as its name implies. Note that abductor pollicis brevis is part of the intrinsic group of hand muscles and will be discussed in the next lesson. In close approximation to the abductor pollicis longus muscle is extensor pollicis brevis. The muscle originates off the posterior aspect of the radius and interosseous membrane, just inferior to the adductor pollicis longus muscle. Its tendon runs alongside the abductor pollicis longus tendon, but continues past its insertion to the proximal phalanx of the first digit. Because it does not project as far as the distal phalanx, the extensor pollicis brevis is an extensor of the first metacarpal phalangeal joint. The longer of the thumb extensors is also found in the posterior compartment. Extensor pollicis longus originates medial to its counterpart and inferior to the abductor pollicis longus, attached to the posterior aspect of the ulna and interosseous membrane. The tendon for extensor pollicis longus takes a less direct route to its destination, projecting more inferiorly as it courses through the extensor retinaculum before running obliquely to attach to the distal phalanx of the first digit. It contracts to extend both the metacarpal phalangeal and interphalangeal joints. Note that when the thumb is extended and abducted, the gap between extensor pollicis longus tendon and the combined extensor pollicis brevis and abductor pollicis longus tendons form an impression known as the anatomical snuff box, so named because of the practice of placing snuff which was a finely ground smokeless tobacco, on the back of the hand in order to inhale it through the nostrils. The landmark is of anatomical significance because of the presence of the radial artery in this region, and of clinical significance because of the ability to palpate the scaphoid, a commonly broken hand bone in this region. More on that in the next lesson. Lying medial to the extensor digitorum longus muscle is extensor indices. It's a small, deeply located muscle that originates off the distal aspect of the radius and interosseous membrane inferior to the extensor pollicis longus muscle. Its tendon courses inferior to the contribution to the second digit from the extensor digitorum muscle to blend into the extensor hood of the index finger. When contracted, the muscle contributes exclusively to extension of the index finger. You can actually do a little trick to highlight the contributions of the different muscles to digital extension. Start with your hand resting on a flat surface, with the hands curled in, as shown. If the index finger is pulled out independently of the other digits, it can be extended with relative ease. Same holds true for the pinky finger. Now try the same thing with your ring finger. Not quite so easy, is it? While the extensor digitorum projects to different digits, the blending in the muscle belly and the distal transverse connections between the extensor tendons keeps the muscle from being able to selectively extend a particular digit in isolation. They tend to extend as a group. The index and pinky fingers can move in isolation due to the specific contributions of the extensor indices and extensor digiti minimi muscles. This makes it much easier to extend these digits in isolation and easier for fans to flash the devil horns at a heavy metal concert. It also means that you have to typically tuck the thumb and hold digits 2, 4, and 5 back anytime you wish to extend digit 3 in order to, well, express your displeasure with someone. The last muscle that we'll discuss is supinator. It originates off the posterior surface of the ulna, lateral epicondyle of the humerus, as well as off the radial collateral and annular ligaments over the head of the radius. It then wraps anterolaterally to insert on the lateral aspect of the radius, just distal to the insertion of the pronator teres muscle. As previously discussed, the muscle wraps posteriorly around the radius and ulna, and therefore serves to unwind the two bones from a pronated position. Also note that the deep branch of the radial nerve, the innervation for the posterior compartment, enters the compartment by running between fibers in the proximal portion of the supinator muscle belly, dividing the muscle into superficial and deep regions.
That covers the extensive list of muscles for the forearm region. Next up, we consider the neurovascular components that both supply the forearm and pass through the forearm to supply the hand. We'll see you then.